Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to share my latest research on red wine. My name is Qi Zhao, and I'm a security researcher from 360 Alpha Lab. And here is a brief introduction of myself and the team. And this is the agenda for today. Firstly, the introduction, backgrounds, and basics. And I will show you how we can find the vulnerabilities from Qualcomm TAs. And after that, we will learn the design of the shared memory model, which will be utilized to do the exploit. And after that, we will make an exploit based on the knowledge we have learned. And we will extract the key box from SFS and secured flash system from Qualcomm. And finally, the closing. So why we are looking into what why on QTE? Because both of them are high value target. For QTE, it has many devices running its chipsets and it's very difficult to do the study and exploit. There are many regions, including this. The internal researchers from Qualcomm have do many works and the so-called low hanging fruits are uh, all be, have been picked up. So make it more difficult to deal with. As for the white wine, Oh, White Wine is a DRM solution provided by a company affiliated to Google. And there are billions of devices running it, and it has hundreds of partners. It will also affect many platforms, not just the QTE. And it has become the de facto standard DM solution for most Android devices. Here, I want to uh, talk about the basics of TrustJohn in one page. The purpose to implement TrustJohn is to do trusted computing in an um, trusted environment and and to protect high value content. And the trust zones features, including new modifications, and uh, as well as the reuse of existing processors, and the possible use of trust zone, including DRM, fingerprints, and key store. And there are many other scenarios. Now here, is, this picture shows the architecture of the trust zone implementation on Pixel 4 XL. And the left size is a, a bit familiar. We have the user space, the kernel, and the hypervisor. And when the trust zone in, is introduced, the there will be a secure world which has its own user space, kernel, and hypervisor. And to interact and switch between the two worlds, a secure monitor will be implemented. OK, I'm going to take a look at how user command is processed in red wine. And here is the entry. And this is the user command buffer and its lines, and the result from the TA and its lines. And we'll look into this function, the dash command handler. In this function, in this line, we could find that finally, a function will get called. And the pointer of this function is read from a global, global pointer. And also, the bound check on input buff and in buff and out, out buff. The bound video is also read from somewhere near this pointer. 
So we find it and let's see what it will do. Well, in this, it is actually a, a table. And in this table, each entry will contain a command ID, the bounds, and the function pointer. OK, as we have find the function pointer of each command handler, we can look into each of them and find if there is any vulnerabilities. And then I find my fir first vulnerability. And this is the invocation graph of it, how to trigger the vulnerability. OK. So the user command, at the first glance, it is a byte array. But of course, it will contain an internal structure. So I have recovered some of the structure as this. And the inner structures, OK, and this one, which is very interesting, the subsample metas. This is an array of up to 20, uh, sorry, 32 elements, and some of its fields have been recovered. So what are the subsamples, and how are they processed? OK, we got this metas, and each element of it contain offset and length information, which can locate them in ink path. And as well as dig buff, both of them can, will contain many subsamples. And the next one, and the next one. OK, we have located this so called subsample. So, how are they processed? They'll get decrypted by this function. And in this function, if the do decrypt is equal to zero, the decryption will be demoted to one copy. Like this, the decryption process. So a summary of the subsample. The subsamples are embedded in the ink buffer and decryption buffer. And the length of and the offset of them are taken from the metas array. And when the do grab is equal to zero, the decryption will be demoted to um, copy. So, okay, we have already seen the vulnerability. Here it is. The subsample of side, there is no bound check on it. So with no bound check, the offset can be very big, and we can make a non copy from an offset and overflow the place to another place. So we have got an uh, vulnerability. The good news is it is accurate. It's non copy rather than memory smashing. So, so we can do very accurate memory manipula manipulation. And uh, if we let the length equal to zero, uh, equal to one, we can make and single byte modification. The bad news is the subsample offset is a 32 bit value that is not big enough to cause integral overflow. So we cannot uh, copy to the address lower than the ink buffer. And, uh, the ink, ink buffer and the decryption buffer. So what's next? We need to find more information so we can turn this vulnerability to um, exploit. We need a address of the TA, and we need a address of our buffers, our shared buffers, and we need a delicate memory layout that can let our memory corruption reach the TA. So the first question, how is the TA allocated in memory? Actually, the memory range pre-allocated for 
PA is is pre, uh, is defined in uh, DTS trick, uh, DTS file, and it's called the CKIPP region, which have a limited memory, uh, physical memory, and limited range. So, also the TA will use a linear map, which means that its physical address is equal to virtual address. Well, as the reason is limited and it is physical fixed physical address, we can bypass the, the ASLR region brute with brute force. We can keep trying to read from a page and the page will crash. But if it doesn't crash, it means that we have reached uh, some pages belong to the TA and we can read, we can prepare some sig signatures of each page and we can compare it with the page we can read from and determine which page we have hit. So we can know the load base of the TA. And after that, we'll find uh, how to know the address of the shared buffers we are controlling. Of course, we need a physical address of both of them. Before that, uh, we'll take a look at how our commands shift from the user space to TA. Here is a very basic send command, uh, send command API that contain no shared memory feature. It will have the send buffer, send buffer length, and the receive buffer and receive buffer length. Okay, when the process is happening, it will call L control to the kernel driver and the kernel will rotate to the TA. After the process, TA will write the result of this of this invocation to the re receive buffer. And finally, the kernel will return the result and the control to the user space. It's very simple and straightforward. But if shared memory is implemented, a new field will be introduced here, the QCCOM INFD info. It is actually a record that contain up to four ion buffers which will tell the kernel that which part of the send buffer is actually a virtual address of shared memory. Okay, then in the kernel, the user virtual address of the shared buffer in the command buffer will be translated into physical drives. I know this code, this code is a bit confusing. I'll show you in the picture. I show you the user space to the kernel and the kernel will make an SMC call to the TA. But before that, the kernel will translate the virtual address to physical address in the same path. And after that, the TA will return with the receive buffer field. And finally, the kernel will return the control to the user space. But before that, the physical address addresses are wiped out for secure region, for security reason, of course. So as the physical address will not get linked to the user space, we need to find a vulnerability that can leak the uh, physical address of the shared memory we are using. Here, we're looking at, into this function, the generate signature function. It is also a command handler in Redwine. And 
it will do this. It will copy part of the command buffer to the res response buffer. And then this part of the response buffer will be used as a parameter to this function, the generic signature function. And then in the generic signature function, the parameter will get updated. But if there is an error, this function will return earlier and uh, leave this value unchanged, which means that there will be, co be a copy from the command buffer to the response buffer. And there is a chance that it will not get modified and will be returned to the user. So what if this part of the command buffer happens to hold the physical address of a shared buffer? Let's see what will happen. A zero user space to kernel and the kernel to the TA. It will do the translation and TA will return where there is a buffer field and the value we want is copied to the receive buffer. And finally, the kernel will return to the user space and get the physical address mapped out. However, a copy of it is left on the receive buffer. So this is the second, second vulnerability. It can leak the physical address of the shared buffer and there are other similar functions that will have the similar similar situation. So we have no the address of TA and the shared buffers. So we need to find a memory layout that can let us utilize this vulnerability. Well, we have tried many approaches, many models, many plans, but they all have their own limitations. Here are my some of my failed attempts. Here, we need a very huge um, buffer range that will contain the ingress buffer and it plus an offset and the decryption buffer and it plus an offset will reach the TA and the mem memory copy will happen this way. It will need at least three buffers. Then to reduce the usage of huge buffer, we come up with this. We just need a very small range of our buffer and we let the increase buffer and decrypt buffer here, and the mem copy will happen from the TA to the TA. Well, however, as we don't have the method to control the TA, we will need to find um, up to 256 variants. We need this much different bytes of different value so we can do an arbitrary byte write. It is also very difficult. And then the sandwich layout will let the TA between the encryption buffer and the decryption buffer. And the mem copy will happen this way. But it may need about three or four buffers. All of these plans have failed. But why? Firstly, we use the CNC command, which has a vulnerability, and the buffer should get mapped to the QTE before get used. Well, the CNC command will only register up to two buffers. So uh, plans using more than two buffers are not, not possible. So and uh, also even we have a way to 
get the physical address of an ion shared buffer, it, it doesn't mean that we can allocate an ion buffer with any physical address. Actually, the ion buffer have many limitations and the buffers are cover out from the ion heaps. And here is how the heaps are defined and only part of them are accepted by the QTE. So we have many, we don't have many candidates to select from. Make it very difficult to find a way. And finally, we get this one. I call it overlapping layout and we'll let the encryption buffer plus is offset equals to the decryption buffer. And the decryption buffer plus and offset will reach the TA. Well, in this, in this uh, memory layout, uh, we only need two buffers and this ion buffering is relatively small enough that so that we can let it fit, fit in one of the scarce memory space we, we can get. And also with this memory layout, it's very easy to make read and write primitives. We just need to swap the encrypt buffer and decrypt buffer. So we have got everything and we have a uh, read and write primitive. It's time to post shell, I think. But however, in the TEs, there is no shell nor calculators to pop. So what should we do to show that we have achieved the exploit? And I find this, it seems that the vendor's uh, values high-value uh, high data is filtration as well as code execution. So I think we can use code execution to exfiltrate high-value data from the white wine. Here is the victim. The get device ID function, which will open and read content from uh, SFS file and copy its content to um, my lock the buffer. Also, its file path is read from the uh, global global offset, which can be controlled by us, so we can use it to read any uh, any secure file system file available. We need to hijack the QCMyLock function with this get robot needs version function. And this function will return a value on the global region, which is also controllable from uh, with our write primitive. We can let this function return a video we want that may be a pointer point to a place that we can reach out. So when the mem, mem copy, uh, when the malloc happens, it will be located, uh, it will return a buffer located in the global region that is readable for us, and then the file content will be copied to that place. And finally, we'll use a read primitive to retrieve the file content from that location. And here is a demo. Well, since the ASLR bypass is time consuming, so I just uh, paste a screenshot here. And finally, the closing source. Firstly, I think as a developer, uh, I think uh, metadata and the data, when they, are get, uh, they get separated, it is very difficult to trace their relation and will cause some errors, cause some vulnerabilities. And uh, also I think it's not a good habit to 
use a buffer that will be returned to the user as a temporary place to store its important data or whatever in some transient data or whatever. Even you think that you will wipe them out, it's not a good habit. What if you forget to wipe them out? There will be a information leakage. And as a security researcher, I think uh, to explore and to understand a system so close sourced as the QTE. I know it's very difficult, so I use a hypothesis and verification workflow. I make some assumption, I make some guess, and I make a experiment and do the experiment and take a look at the return value to see if our hypothesis is right. With this function, I have find the internal logic of the system. And these are the people I want to say thanks to. And I also need to thank to you, my audience. Thank you for your time. And that's all of my presentation. Thanks.